I'm going to get a lot of hate for this, but I'm going to be honest, which is the hard truth is we expect other people to be likable at work, but we expect that we should be able to be direct and everybody should be fine with it. I see it all the time, right? Where we think, man, this coworker is so hard to work with. They never get me what I need. They are always difficult. They always say no. But then when people turn around and ask us for stuff, we say no all the time. We're really direct, really aggressive with our language, and we expect them to be fine with it. We have this intrinsic double standard for the way we like to be communicated with and the way we like to communicate to other people. And when you come to terms with that, to start off, you're going to be in a much better position because the number one rule of corporate communication is empathy. That's it. It comes down to understanding what do other people want or need out of an interaction and how is that going to help you get what you need. Welcome back to Secrets of a Corporate Game. So many people are trying to navigate a corporate world that is laden with secrets, cleverly hidden and unspoken rules to a game that most employees don't even know they're playing. On this podcast, we try to give you a peek behind the curtain and unveil some of those secrets with tips and tricks that you can apply today to start taking control of your career and progress up the ladder faster. Hi, my lovelies. Welcome back to another episode of Secrets of the Career Game. I am your host. Kendall Berg, that career coach. And today we are talking about talking at work. I've been getting a lot of questions lately about how to improve your executive presence, how to improve your communication skills, and how to talk the talk that is corporate jargon. So we're going to be covering these myriad of topics on today's episode. So buckle up, be prepared to listen to me chat, be prepared to chat yourselves, and let's jump into it. So first off is that there is an art to corporate communication, all right? And one of the original videos that really, uh, let's say, put me on the map on social media was about how to soften your language for corporate. And softening your language, I think, gets a really bad reputation because it implies that we are insincere or we are inauthentic or we are brown nosing, um, or even really just playing the game in general can get a bad rep because it feels kind of icky. But the reality is that people want to work with people they like. And when you think of your own experience within the corporate world, odds are that there are people you don't like working with, and you may take a little bit longer to get back on their requests. You may give them a little less information when they ask for things. You may also just generally avoid them when possible in the workplace. And the reality is that a lot of that comes down to differing communication styles or the way that they communicate. And so the same is true for other people. And and we're going to jump into the hard truth of this whole episode right away, which is the hard truth is we expect other people to be likable at work but we expect that we should be able to be direct and everybody should be fine with it. I see it all the time, right? Where we think, man, this coworker is so hard to work with. They never get me what I need. They are always difficult. They always say no. But then when people turn around and ask us for stuff, we say no all the time. We're really direct, really aggressive with our language, and we expect them to be fine with it. We have this intrinsic double standard for the way we like to be communicated with and the way we like to communicate to other people. And when you come to terms with that, to start off, you're going to be in a much better position because the number one rule of corporate communication is empathy. That's it. It comes down to understanding what do other people want or need out of an interaction and how is that going to help you get what you need. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you're finding the information on this podcast helpful and you're looking to take control of your career and start to elevate yourself to the next level, go ahead and check out our course. Go to bit.ly slash career coach course to get signed up today and to start taking your career to the next level and navigate the secrets of the career game. When we can understand what other people need, what their priorities are, what their goals are, we will ultimately become far more effective in our jobs. And so as you are improving your communication, improving your executive presence, your ability to interact with the individuals that you work with, understanding their perspective is step number one. Because to us, we get blinders on, we get tunnel vision of, hey, here's what I need to accomplish. Here's where I need to go. Here's what I'm trying to do. And 
we don't always take the time to take a step back and say, okay, but how does this affect what this person is doing? Does this person have enough bandwidth? What are their biggest priorities, their biggest goals? Is this helping them in some way? Because when we can communicate something in terms of how it adds value to the other person, that is when we're going to get the best partnership. So we want to be direct in our communication. We want to communicate what we need. We want to give the right context, but we want to do it in a way that is palatable and digestible and not alienating. All right. So what does this mean? So rather than saying, no, that's a dumb idea, which is what I want to say a lot. And so most of you guys probably want to say a lot. No, that's a stupid idea. Please don't do that. Or, hey, that will never work because of this. Or, hey, there's too big of a risk over here with this. Instead of that, we want to follow, acknowledge, and then respond. What this means is, hey, I totally understand where you're going with that. That's an acknowledgement. But I have concerns about how that would work in this situation. That's a response. Hey, I really appreciate you coming to me for this ask. That's an acknowledgement. But right now, I don't have the capacity to fulfill this request. That's a response. When we're communicating with other people, we want to start with an acknowledgement of what they're trying to accomplish, of their value, their intelligence, their perspective, and then respond with how we feel about a situation. This sounds uh, to some people probably labor intensive. Like, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just say no? But the reality is that this is going to make your response much easier to digest by that person. It's going to soften the blow of whatever comes second. It's kind of like the compliment sandwich that we talked about in our performance reviews episode a couple of weeks ago. It's going to help you get what you need. It's going to help them feel, oh, she understood me. She got my perspective. She has an alternate perspective, but there's that bit of buffer there that we need. So we need to be acknowledging before we respond. The second thing is that when we ask for things, we need to put it in terms of what they care about. Right. So we started this episode with we need to understand empathy. We need to understand their perspective. So if I'm going to the head of finance to ask for something, I need to put that in terms of cost. Hey, I really need this extract of data. This is really going to help us be more efficient in our budget planning cycle for next year. It's going to help us save money, but also ensure that we're more accurate with the requests we send your way. That is what they care about, justified by what I need. They're much more likely to fulfill that request than, hey, can you send me this big data dump? Why do you need it? What is it for? Where is it going? Right? Those are the types of questions we get that slows down our progress, makes it more difficult. If we come out and say, hey, here's the impact I'm going to give you. Here's what I'm going to do that's going to help you. Here's what I need. We will almost always get a faster, better response. Okay. If I'm going to sales, hey, sales, I need you guys to attend this big training. If I just say, hey, you guys are all in this mandatory training. I'm probably going to get a not so great response. But if I say, hey, I've noticed recently that our conversion rate has been decreasing. We're bringing in a specialist who has the highest conversion rate in their company at X percent. We want them to teach best practices to you guys so that you guys can drive up that revenue volume and get some more sales. Probably a much more positive response coming from sales for that. Like, oh, wow, that'd be really great. That's really going to help me hit my goals. That'd be awesome. Right. So we want to think about how do we ask for things in terms of what other people care about? It's going to help make us more efficient, right? So if we acknowledge and then respond when we have a negative response and we ask for things in terms of what other people care about, we're ultimately already going to be setting ourselves up for more success. Now, the third piece of this is that you have to speak, okay? Um, I had a conversation with a client the other day on this exact topic where there are some people who are naturally much more dominant in meetings, Right? These could be people who are natural extroverts. It could be people with a lot of experience. Um, they could be people whose just general personality is to speak up. And then there are other people who really struggle with this. They tend to be more introverted. They tend to be more quiet. They're more listeners. And there's nothing wrong with either of these types of individuals. Okay, But in order to have your perspective heard, in order to be able to drive your team forward the way that you want to, in order to be able to advocate for yourself to get a promotion, you have to be able to talk about those things. Now, most people where they struggle with speaking up is, A, I don't know what to say, or B, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging or I'm only talking about myself or I only care about myself, right? Those are the two situations where I see people are most reticent to speaking up in a meeting. So if you don't know what to say, start doing some pre-work. If you know you're going to be in a meeting with leadership, you know that you're going to be in a meeting with executives, before the meeting, write down your attendees list and write down what they care about next to it. And then if you know the topic of the meeting, maybe you write down a few questions that you're going to have that you want answered over the course of the call. That's going to help prepare you so that when you get in that meeting and people are discussing something, 
you can say, hey, actually, I had a question about this. I was really curious, how does this fit into Steve's division? Right now, we're drawing correlations. We're creating more collaboration space. We're building connection, right? And we're getting to speak out, voice our opinion, and hold our presence. Okay, these are really important. The second thing is not wanting to talk about ourselves. And the tip that I find is the most helpful here is rather than talking about yourself, your work, your team, think about your impact, right? The same way that if you were a CEO and you ran your own business, and we kind of touched on this when we talked about performance reviews as well, but if you're a CEO and you ran your own business, you wouldn't go into a meeting and be like, I am fantastic. Here is my 82 different pieces of work experience that are relevant to this conversation. You wouldn't go in and you wouldn't brag about that, but you would say, hey, in order to drive this forward, here's what I need. In order to deliver this impact, here's what I need. Hey, I want to give a shout out to my team that was able to deliver this impact last month, right? When we think of talking about the impact rather than the person or rather than the task, it becomes much easier to speak up in those advocating opportunities for ourselves. Okay, so as a quick recap, when we're trying to improve our communication skills, one, we start with empathy, put things in terms of what they care about. Then we work on our acknowledgements before we respond. Build that into your tool set. Make that a regular situation. This is true in emails. It's true in verbal communication. It's going to help your pushback or even your positive responses be received in a better way. And then lastly, make sure you're not afraid to speak up, that you know what kind of questions to ask, you know what types of facts you want to put forward, and you know how to advocate for yourself and your team. These three pieces really come together to build strong overall communication skills that are going to push your career forward. Second thing that I want to talk about today is I don't want you to argue. This has been coming up a lot lately, so I don't know what's going on in the corporate world, but I'm feeling some stress. I don't know if it's the fact that we are basically in a recession. I don't know if it's all the layoffs that have taken place, but I'm feeling a little bit of heat, okay? And I'm hearing a lot of heat from you guys who are submitting your questions, who are reaching out to me for advice. Seems like things are a little bit stressful. And so one of the big questions that's been coming up is what do I do when I don't want to do something? What do I do when I disagree with a perspective? And Amazon has a term called disagree and commit. It's something that they actually evaluate their employees on. And the concept of disagree and commit is, hey, voice your concerns, voice any risks that you see or any challenges that may occur, and then commit to doing it anyways. Obviously, there's a fine line here, right? If this is something that is morally or legally wrong, do not disagree and commit, just disagree, okay? But in the absence of something that's going to cross a real line in the sand, say they want to roll out an operational process and we're like, hey, that operational process is not going to work. It's going to create a bunch of overhead. This is going to create an entire cottage industry. We're going to be spinning our wheels. It's really, really bad. We don't want to do it. There's a lot of jargon there. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Then we say, hey, here are the risks that I see. Right. So step one is how do you articulate risk? It's not, hey, I can't do that. Hey, no. Hey, that won't work. It's there are some risks that I see. One is overload on the existing employees based on increased overlook overhead. One is potential opportunities for human errors because we're increasing the number of steps, the number of things they have to do each time. And then we want to provide optionality. Okay, so optionality is so, so, so important, especially when you're communicating with executives. Hey, I can do exactly what you're saying. But as I said, here are my risks. Here's my concerns. Here's what I think the overall cost of that's going to be. Eventually, we're going to have to increase resource headcount. We're going to have to increase QA to minimize human errors and avoid audits, right? Or we could do option B. Option B is like a hybrid. It's a little bit of what you want and a little bit of what I think the best solution is. And we could pull those together and see if maybe that works. And we run it as a pilot to test it and see how it goes. Or option three is maybe we try a different solution that ultimately gets us to the same place. It delivers that same impact, but in a different way. These would be my suggestions. Which one would you like to go forward with? Right now, we've articulated our risks. We've given optionality. And then if they choose the first option that we think is bad, we say, great. Thanks so much for letting me know. We send a recap email. Hey, based on our conversation today, I outlined these risks. I provided these options. We decided to go with option A. That's what I'll be proceeding with. Okay, it's a little bit of CYA, cover your, and that way you can protect yourself in case this goes awry in the future. But maybe they come back and they say, hey, I really appreciate you bringing this up. Let's try option B. Let's try a hybrid approach. I'd love to get some feedback on this. Great, now we have a new direction, right? So we communicate the risks, communicate optionality, and then we commit and you just get it done. Do not sit there and argue. This is a mistake I have made. This is a mistake I regularly make, okay? Um, Because... 
we have a tendency to tie the performance of our job to who we are as a person. And we feel like if we do something wrong, if we do something bad, if we do an initiative and it doesn't go well, we aren't good. We are bad. We're a poor performer. Or we're just afraid we're going to get fired, depending on the company culture, right? When in reality, the situation is much better if we say, hey, here's my risks, here's my concerns, here's my options. They say do it anyway, and we just go do it. Then we're showing ability to listen to leadership. We're still being effective. We're still driving things forward. And then if ultimately it doesn't work out, we communicate that. And then we roll on to the next one, right? So don't sit there and argue about your per- perspective, especially if you can feel that people aren't open to that. You don't have that type of rapport. You're not getting a positive response because when we argue too much, what ends up happening is we alienate ourselves from our peers and our leadership. And that's when you end up getting fired, getting demoted, plateauing, being managed out, icing out, right? So make sure that we're not arguing to the point where we take things too far, but make sure that we still feel comfortable and we're in a good culture where we're able to state our opinions and our perspectives. So now we're going to circle back to one of my favorite topics that's been coming up a lot lately, which is corporate jargon. So I am the first to admit that I use a lot of corporate jargon. Um, I had a good friend once tell me that I reminded her of Jen Psaki because of the way that I communicate. And I think Jen Psaki like literally invented corporate jargon as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Jen Psaki was um, public relations for President Obama, in case you're not familiar. And she used very specific language in all of her press releases. Um, and now we all use it too. So corporate jargon is a really great tool. Um, I know there's lots of creators on social media, myself included, who make fun of it, right? Um, where an entire sentence could be only corporate jargon and actually have no meat in it whatsoever and not be valuable at all. That definitely happens. I've worked with leaders like that. But the reality is, that when you're speaking the same language as somebody else, then what you're saying is going to be more impactful, right? And if you think of this from a true language barrier perspective, that's obvious, right? If I'm speaking Spanish and you're speaking English, we're probably not on the same page, generally, unless we're both bilingual, which would be awesome, okay? The same is true with corporate jargon. When we use the jargon effectively, you can really push forward change and you can get alignment much faster from the individuals you're involved with. Okay. I've used a lot already in this episode. Like I said, I'm very guilty of layering corporate jargon and phrasing into my everyday speech. Um, In fact, my seven-year-old daughter also talks like that. And when she uses corporate jargon to discuss things with her teacher, I kind of want to facepalm because a lot of that is my fault. But Corporate jargon is a strong tool. So some of the ways we can use this. Now, if you are um, if you are signed up for my digital course in the communication module, there is a list of corporate jargon terms. It is super great. It's super helpful. If you're not signed up for my course and you want to be, head on over to my website, thatcareercoach.net, and check that out. But corporate jargon, you can look up lists other places. Um, but a lot of it I find is specific to your company. So when I first started working in corporate, I had a notebook that was literally just terms and acronyms. It's a whole notebook. It's like 42 pages of just terms and acronyms that nobody uses outside of the corporate world. So when you start a new job, I would start to write down all the acronyms they use, right? All the acronyms. What are they? What do they mean? How do they get used? For terminology, there's a few that are really common. We'll touch through a few in this episode, um, but that I think get used well in certain situations. So um, I hate the phrase circle back, but I use it because it's effective and we're going to circle back next week, right? So circle back is a term that's used a lot, basically saying, hey, we're going to table this and we'll come back to it. Let's table this is another one. Let's connect on this offline. Right. Which basically means, hey, this meeting is not intended for the purpose you're trying to make it intended. Let's connect separately and discuss this. Let's table it. Let's take it offline. Um, Some other ones that I really like are impact, effectiveness, utilization. Right. When it comes down to how you talk about the work that you're delivering, using words like this is driven this X efficiency. This is leading to an impact of X revenue gain. Those types of phrases are going to be more impactful because, again, we're speaking the same language as the leader who is reaping the benefit of that work. So layer in whatever is most common in your company. Um, A big one I hear all the time is low-hanging fruit. 
So low-hanging fruit is a term for, hey, this is something that's not going to require a lot of effort, but it's going to deliver decent impact, right? That's considered low-hanging fruit. It's not hard to do, and we're going to see a result relatively quickly, all right? Uh, nobody uses the term high-hanging fruit, in case you were curious. That's not a thing. Please don't use that in a sentence. Uh, but low-hanging fruit is really common. Um, SWOT analysis, if you're not familiar with that, this is less of a, a jargon and more of a type of analysis, but people throw it around a lot. Like, hey, we should do a SWOT on that. Just Google it. It's uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's a way of evaluating certain projects. Um, so think through the corporate jargon that your team uses. Start to listen for it. If you hear a term that's being used a lot, um, I would write it down. I would keep it on a notebook or a sticky note of like, hey, this is something that the company is is throwing around often. Um, I worked for a company that used to opine on a lot of things. It's not my favorite term. It's technically a legal term. You shouldn't be opining if you're not a lawyer, personal perspective. Um, but we used opine a lot. It was like, this person should opine on this. Um, it's a very common language at that particular company. So each company is a little bit different. Figure out what your buzzwords are going to be. Um, company that I'm at right now is like scale, synergies, and innovate. Those are like the three really big buzzwords. Everything is to create scale. Everything is to create synergies. Everything is an innovation. Um, so figure out exactly what it is that your company cares about, what they're talking about, and then start to find ways to weave that into your language more often. It's going to allow you to open doors. I know it sounds stupid because you're like, what do they care if I use the word opine instead of give me their opinion? They care because people are giant parrots and we like to hear consistent language and we like to repeat it back to people. And so if they use a word often and you use it in response, you've got a better synergy there. It's another good corporate jargon word. Get a lot of synergies. Um, it's going to allow you to communicate more effectively. So start to lean into that corporate jargon. I know it's icky. I know we make fun of it all the time, but the reality is it does help. Um, I saw a meme on social media. I'll try and find it if I can. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's an individual and he's talking about how the way he writes emails is completely different to the individual he is in real life. And then when he writes email, he's like, thank you so much for circling back, Jessica. I'd love to opine on this on Monday. Um, and I feel we're all that way a little bit. It's like writing the email. It's like, screw you, you suck. And then the second email is per my previous email. Um, so feel free to start to use that corporate jargon. It's going to allow you to communicate more effectively and at a more elevated level. Right. We want to sound like the leaders because that's how you get perceived as a leader. Um, this is going to bring me to how we communicate up to leaders. This is kind of our last topic for today. So we've covered how to be direct but soft, what kind of tools to use in your language, why you shouldn't argue too much, how to leverage corporate jargon in an effective way. And we're going to talk a little bit about communicating up. So I had an executive tell me once that every executive puts their pants on the same way. I've heard this phrase used a lot. The reality is that we are all nervous when we get in front of an executive team. All of us, we're all nervous, okay? Even executives get nervous in front of other executives. It happens. So if your fear from communicating well with an executive is like, oh, well, I'm too junior. I don't know them. I haven't spent enough time with them. Everybody feels that way. The difference between people who are successful communicating with leaders and people who aren't is the people who are successful did it anyways. They set themselves up for success. They did the exercise I mentioned earlier. They wrote down, hey, these are the executives that are going to be in attendance. Here's what they care about. Here's what types of questions I would have for them. Here's what types of questions I anticipate they're going to ask me. They do a little bit of pre-work. They walk into that meeting, and even though they're nervous and their voice might be shaking and their hands might be sweaty, they still do it. Okay, so a lot of this is overcoming your initial fear. Something I also find is the more often that you're facing off with executives, the less daunting it becomes, right? I work a lot um, with some of my C-suite. And when I do, at the beginning, when I first started working at the company, I was very nervous, like, oh my gosh, this is my first presentation. I want it to go really well. Now I'm much more comfortable and I feel a lot more confident going into those meetings, knowing that they want me to be successful. And this is the second big misconception I see when we're working with executives is we feel like, oh, they're going to try and trip me up. They're going to think of something I haven't thought of. They're going to try and catch me in something that's wrong. The reality is that they want you to be successful because they don't want to have this meeting again. They're busy. They don't want to have to keep revisiting this topic. So they're hoping you have all of your ducks in a row so that they can have this conversation one time and move on with their lives. They are rooting for you. The reality is you have to be prepared. It doesn't mean that they won't ask you anything that you don't have an answer prepared for, which quick aside, 
in your back pocket, you should always have a response ready when you're asked something you don't know. So mine is, you know what? That's a great question. We had considered A, but we hadn't considered that exactly. Let me circle back with the team today and I'll get your response by end of tomorrow. It's my go-to. That way I still sound confident. I still sound in control. I still feel ready to respond to their question, even though in reality, I don't have an answer. Okay. So always have an answer ready for a question you don't have an answer for. Side note. But they want you to have the right answers. They want you to get the yes that you're looking for. Otherwise, they wouldn't be taking time out of their day to meet with you. So if you go into this, even though you're scared, step one, and then you go into it knowing that they want you to be successful, step two, you have a much higher probability of actually being successful. All right, both of those are going to increase your confidence stepping into this room. The third piece of interacting effectively with executives, I feel like I've used the word effectively a lot today. Corporate jargon of the day is effective. Okay. When you are facing off with a senior leader, it is really important to keep in mind the appropriate level of detail. I've worked with lots of executives, um, various CFOs, CEOs, COOs, CTOs. Every single one of them prefers a different level of detail. And especially in your early presentations, you probably won't know exactly what level of detail that individual prefers. So the way that I generally like to structure conversations is in my main deck, always go with the deck. I don't care if you're an IT developer. I don't care if you're an HR. I don't care if you are in operations. You should have a deck. If you're talking to an executive, have a deck. Okay. I like to have a core deck that is high level. Here's the problems I'm trying to solve. Here's the things I considered and the assumptions I made. Here's the solutions that I'm putting forth, usually with optionality, going back to optionality. And here's my recommendation and next steps. Then in your appendix, you have supporting detail. Here's why I decided this was the right solution. Here's the data that backs it up. Here's the graphs that support it. That way, if you have an executive who likes to be in the weeds, who likes a lot more information, you can say, hey, I'm so glad you asked that question. If we jump ahead to the appendix in slide 14, you'll see this is the analysis that we ran. Here's the assumptions we made. Here's the data outcome. This is what led us to making this decision, right? But if you have an executive who doesn't want to be in the weeds, who wants to be high level, you're not dragging them through every single thought you had while you were determining the solution. You're taking them straight to the solution and letting them ask what questions they want. If you're prepared and you've thought through it, you're going to have answers to most of their questions anyways. Okay, and this is where I see people really get tripped up. They go into an executive conversation and they're like, let me tell you how I did this. And we go step by step by step by step by step by step by step to get them where we want them. The reality is most executives kind of want to jump ahead. Great, what are we doing and why? And if we can convince them what we're doing and why and the right answers, and we have the detail in our back pocket to answer any additional questions that they have, we're probably going to get the yes that we want. So don't go too far in the weeds. Have your supporting information ready, but instead be prepared to communicate that impact, that why, that how, and the options that you're putting forth to them. If you can do that well, odds are they'll very rarely ask you for the detail. I had a leader once, and while Um, there was a lot of friction early on in our relationship. One of the key things that I learned is she told me, when you bring something to me, I only need to know what you need from me. I don't need to drink out of the fire hydrant that is every piece of analysis Kendall has ever done. I just need to know what you need, what decisions need to be made and why. And that was a really big turning point for me in my career because up until that point, a lot of my job was justifying what I was recommending via my analysis. And then once you get to a more senior level, it becomes about, hey, what do you need from me? What decision do you need me to make? What recommendation do you need me to sign off on? Where do we need to go next? And it's a lot less about how did you get there? They may ask questions to make sure you got there the way they want you to, but they don't really need to be walked through it. So really make sure that you pay attention to the right level of detail when you're presenting to those executives, and that'll set you up for more success as well. And then the last piece that is going to be kind of an overarching theme for all of this is when you are working on your communication in corporate, you cannot be reactive and responsive. I'm going to get a lot of hate for this, but I'm going to be honest. When you are emotional at work, when you respond emotionally, when you react emotionally, whether this be frustration, anger, sadness, um, volatility, any of those responses are going to demean and undermine your authority. When you are at work, the best thing you can do for your communication is to stay level-headed and to stay calm. This means that every answer is a, sure, I can do that. Here's what it costs. 
or, hey, I'd be able to take on that project. Here's the trade off or, hey, here's the options I want to give you. Everything needs to be cool, calm, and collected. And I know this is easier said than done. Something I work with clients a lot on is how do we create proactive responses and have them ready before things go wrong so that we don't walk into a room and end up with it blowing up in our face. But my biggest advice to you is in all of these communications, whether it's peer-to-peer, from you to your boss, you to your team, you to an executive, the best thing you can do for your career is not be reactive and instead be prepared. The more prepared you are walking into a room, the less likely you are to explode over something stupid. So I hope you guys found today's conversation helpful. As I mentioned throughout the episode, if you want more information about corporate jargon and communication, you can check out my course at thatcareercoach.net or look into coaching with me as well if you want a little bit more one-on-one catered support. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for tuning in today's episode. Go ahead and leave me five stars and any questions that you have below in the comments. Otherwise, we'll be back next week with another great episode.